So we'll present code tagging and some of the applications that we uh, prepared for this mechanism. Um, so let's start with definition of code tagging. Is a very short description that I, the shortest description I could come up with is basically it, it's a mechanism that allows us to statically allocate custom structures which are associated with specific uh, locations in the code. Um, and uh, basically what that allows us is to, two major uh, benefits is that uh, storage for those structures are, uh, is allocated at compile time. Um, and the second one is that there's no lookup for that pointer. So whenever we need to update that structure, the custom structure, we don't need to chase that pointer or do any kind of lookups. So that gives us basically a very fast access to, the, to it. In addition, it uh, records the location uh, where that structure was used and allocated. And it's also very easy to navigate between them because they're kind of allocated in one section. And examples that the data that we collect using this mechanism very efficiently. I can interject. So the, this is an old trick in the kernel of, we wouldn't need this in a language that had constructors because you would just write a constructor that has the object being constructed to some sort of global list or global data structure so you can find them afterwards. Uh, instead, what we do in the kernel, what has been done like half a dozen times is you declare all your, your static structs. It's used for like bug info, uh, Ftrace uses a bunch. Uh, and you put them in a special else section. Then you can just treat the else section as an array. Really slick. But then it gets complicated with modules. Uh, and so everyone's been open coding this. So we turned it into a library. All right. Um, so let's go to the first application that we had for it. So uh, basically, the first application that we came up with, and that's how the whole idea started, was, was a memory allocation. Um, tracking and um, so what what we did here is we instrumented uh, slab and page uh, uh, allocators um, in a way that we basically track the number of allocation in the allocations so whenever we allocate memory we increment uh, our counter and the size in our custom structure and whenever we deallocate we decrement so if uh, it's it can be used for memory leak tracking also can be used to find out uh, which locations in the code base are heavily used. So basically that can provide some information where we want to optimize things um, and which places are not that important. Um, so uh, to do that, we, we use, uh, for page allocations, we use page extension to record the pointer and to be able to... Let's take a step back and like describe at a high level what this is about. Right. The next slide has that. Uh, I think what, how I'd really describe this is we've had profiling for years and years for CPU usage. It's easy to, to profile your program and see where, where is your CPU time going. What we've had uh, is profiling for memory usage. The closest thing that I know, know the, that comes to this is TCMLOC, and it's not very easy to use. This is just shows up in DebugFS, and it's cheaper to enable than memcg. And so, but in addition to that, uh, actually, in addition to that, when we uh, identify locations which might be leaking memory, for example, uh, that information, just the number of allocations and the overall size doesn't give us much to uh, fix that. So we also implemented the context capture support. So whenever we see some specific location is growing, let's say, or we see some abnormal uh, patterns there, we can enable context capture rule, which basically will capture us, for us, uh, which process was allocating memory, uh, the timestamp, when it was done, and most importantly, call stack. Where was it called from? Uh, so that adds an overhead, but that overhead will be only for that particular location. We are not gonna be uh, capturing all this data for all the locations, like for example, page, uh, uh, page owner does. In this case, we can selectively 
uh, choose which allocations we are more interested about and uh, dig into that basically uh, look at it much closer um, this provides us more information and hopefully enough information to chase the problems uh, when we see them All right, uh, so I've done that kind of thing with uh, the trace points. Uh, we ended up with issues at some point uh, with the uh, compiler and linker uh, up aligning the structure. So if you have a structure alignment that is larger than your section alignment, you can end up with padding. So you cannot iterate that as an array when you have padding. Oh, you're, you're stashing a pointer allocation so that on, you can, uh, don't stash the pointer with the object. We store it in the same area that MCG uses. Okay, so you basically, so you have an array of pointer to iterate on? Yeah. Okay, good, perfect, that's I what I did. I wanted to do it your way and CERN and the MCG people for, for alignment. Okay, good, perfect. And uh, the other question is, that, that uh, section, is it kind of read-only or do you update it? Uh, the, the section with the, uh, the alloc tag, that's where we keep the statistics. So you update it? Yep. Yeah. It has so, to be redrivable because we we update it whenever that code. So it's not we, per CPU, it's a global counter, right? Uh, actually, I wrote uh, lazy, lazy per CPU counters specifically for this. We don't have to burn per CPU uh, memory for per CPU counters in every allocation site. Some fancy code that starts out as an atomic counter and then of the rate of updates and switches. Okay, because with this CPU ops, you could directly have per CPU counters and just have kind of read-only information in there to kind of track what you are keeping track of and keep the, the counters separate in per, per CPU memory. I don't see that it necessarily matters whether the alloc tag itself is read, read right or not. For a reason then. Yeah, it's, it's application specific. In, in case of memory uh, tracking, we do need write access because we are updating those counters. Uh, but there could be some applications which need just a read only data. It, it also saves a pointer chase. Uh, so if there's no cache length contention, that it is slower than the atomic counter faster. Oh, yeah, in this case, yes. Given you have the, the counter is in your section mm -hmm. already. Yeah, exactly. okay, thanks. All right. If no more questions about this part, I'll let Ken about more applications. I've got a, a couple other fun things. Uh, fault injection. Fault injection in the kernel, but it's a little bit limited compared to this. Uh, if anyone has looked at fail slab, you can specify, say, the uh, the process ID that you want to fail slab all allocations for, but you can't drill down to the exact call site, as far as I know. Yes, use the same hooks that we use for allocation tagging, and this gives you fault injection points for every tameloc and alloc pages, et cetera, call, and you can switch them on and off on a file or line or module basis. It's dead easy to use. All you all you insert is a call to a dynamic fault. You don't have to have a separate dynamic fault. It goes up in debug fs. And this is only like a couple hundred lines of code to implement too. Now that we've got proper libraries for this stuff, super exciting. Latency tracking. Latency tracking is something that I've wanted for years and years and years. Back when I was at Google, we used to have a thing. Uh, I completely forgot the name of it. But it was used for tracking latencies of BIOS all throughout the IO stack. It was a really brilliant idea. Unfortunately, the code was too terrible to live. It doesn't exist anymore, as far as I know. And I'm hoping to regrow some of that functionality in a way that's sustainer. With this, we use the same idea of create these hooks that declare in a macro uh, an object that shows up in debug events, but we, we use it for time stats. This time stats code comes from bcache and bcachefs. It data points that correspond to events that have a duration, and it generates nice statistics for you. 
So what I did with this, I hooked, I instrumented every single wait event call in the kernel, everything that uses the prepare to wait mechanism. And it all just shows up in DebugFS. Gives you count, rate, frequency, average duration, max duration, quantiles. We're going to be making some improvements to that's called uh, yeah, statistics. Adding standard deviation, weighted, and uh, normal standard deviation. The idea with this stuff is in, in contrast to trace points where you kind of have to uh, enable tracing and go looking for uh, to start gathering information. I want something that's cheap and always on. I, a lot of times I'm debugging things where I'm interacting with a user over IRC or over internet, and I want, I want them to be able to get the information that I need as easily as possible. And I also want that information to be collect, collected full time so that it's already there when we run into something weird. But this will be able to, when something weird happens, through the, the collected latency information and see which events have current standard deviation or average that's wildly different from the historical since uh, the system has been up. Oh, wait, there's more. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't go to question. Uh, is there an option to, to clear out the structure, you know, to it, because maybe you do want it from the dawn of time, but maybe sometimes you want to reset the data and then look at it some more. Not currently, but that would be pretty trivial. Yeah. yeah, that would be a great yeah. idea to have. Yeah, uh, the tax stats code is nice and small, easy to work with. I'm sure people could have fun coming up with new things to do with it. If, if it's always on, how do you detect overflows? Or is it like overflow detection? Uh, everything is UC cores. Oh, okay. <laughs> So, who has had to debug a problem where some code that you don't normally work with is returning enomam or enval single peg, and the person who wrote the code did not add proper log messages, thousands and thousands of lines of code to sift through? Go hands. Yeah. <laughs> like the idea here. <laughs> what if we just had more error codes? What if we have a, a unique error code for every site in the kernel throws an error? What if we had a unique error code for every site in the kernel that throws an error? So this error macro does that and it uses the code tagging thing to behind the scenes do the actual allocation. You pass it, say, enomem, and it returns you a unique error code. Really cool thing about this is then the error string or error name and the percent PE uh, printf extension, they then return you an error string that tells you the file and line number where that error came from. I think that's all the magic that I have to present today. Uh, questions? Can user space get that uh, information out from a, uh, after, say, a system call fails? Would user space be able to look up the uh, that error code? Because that sounds wonderful. So that the trouble with that is that it would be would then be returning. We'd have to return a new incompatible error code that existing user space code doesn't know about. If we can. I mean, we'd have to like rev the syscall interface somehow and pass that out of band. Uh, I would love to do that though. I think it totally makes sense if we can figure out a not too complicated way to do it. I was talking to Julia Lal the other day at uh, the Rust conference. She says converting existing code to use a macro with Cochinelli would be totally straightforward. Uh, about this question, actually, for uh, reporting that to user space, we had some discussions at uh, FCS uh, to do something like this. Uh, we did it for our internal projects, but we never got around to do it for the kernel. What worked all, uh, very well for us is to accumulate error codes in a stack. So, so as you are in a system call, you may be, so you start down at a very deep level, you have an error, and then it pops up, and then it can emit other errors. So, so every level of the stack may tell you something about what happened. 
then you want that stack requeryable from user space to see, oh, from where did it fail and what happened at every level. That, that's a little bit trickier because then it gets into some kind of dynamic allocation. Or you could have you could have a stack and like task struct that you pre-allocated, and that, that might work. Th this was like dirt simple. Some ideas about yeah. ABI that could be created for that. Yeah. The only real change to the kernel is uh, for that error code thing is we have to increase max error no, uh, for pointer error. We end up having to reserve, I, I reserve like one megabyte at the top of the address space. I think, I think we can do that for better error codes. Uh, mapping set error is the only thing that... Say, say again? Uh, mapping set er error where the uh, struct address space gets an ERNO stuck in it. So generally it's either EIO or um, ENO space. But theoretically we could have all 1024 different errors put into it. I think we need to rework that mechanism. It, it, it was an improvement of what we had, but we, anyway, you, can, like, you and I can talk about that offline. It's not a big deal. A general question just about the whole framework um, it seems I like how easy it is, and I think the benefits are outweighing any any memory usage. But it does sound like it makes it so easy that you can have just all these ELS sections with all of this extra static data. Is there like a tracking mechanism for it, or just bloatometer? I guess. Which uh, yeah, since uh, any any tool that shows you the size of your ELF sections. Okay. Another tool, another thing to go wild with. I was wondering, uh, uh, since, since you, uh, for the pages, you do the page X, which uh, currently means it's always uh, allocated. Uh, so one thing would be, of course, I, I think all, you already got the feedback that there should be a boot time enable option. So distros can uh, compile this and only use when they want to avoid uh, both the memory overhead and the uh, runtime overhead. Right. But otherwise, yeah. Yeah, I think that's what we want actually feedback on. Uh, one of the feedbacks from RFC sounds like uh, one of the biggest things that we need to add is to, to be able to disable it. Uh, right now, we uh, we allow it to disable it from config <clears throat> when we basically at compile time. But sounds like we might need also um, support that from kernel command line or maybe even at runtime. Uh, yeah, so and the, the page X memory over it is currently just the boot time thing, but if you made it to runtime, it would be. There's, there's two separate things like page X versus maybe if this is useful enough, we could stick it in struct page. Option. Yeah, I was wondering whether you could do the same like with the slabs, like reuse the MCG field to point to something that stores both the MCG and the tag, whether the combination of those would be ultimately lower yeah. overhead than pages. Yeah, for slabs, that what we are doing. We are sticking that pointer in the MCG data. And actually, we have a patch that makes that MCG data more generically used, usable. So object we can extension. basically, right. So it's now it's called object extension, where MCG is just one thing that we can store there. Yeah. So okay. generally, I think it it opens up more opportunities in the future. Also, uh, yeah. And right now, the this whole um, mechanism is built so that we try to minimize the overhead uh, as much as possible, so that we can enable it in runtime in the production or pre-production testing. Uh, and right now, the biggest um, overhead is from like looking up the page extension, for example. So if we can. Um, find, uh, you know, uh, use some mechanism which minimizes even that. Even further, that would be obviously would open up this mechanism to more applications. Page allocator is already pretty heavyweight compared to slab allocator, so I don't think the page extension is really killing <coughs> us. It's not that big as a fraction of the total allocation path. Slab, the slab fast path is way faster. That's where we really do want to be fast. So um, on, on the note of, uh, I don't know, asking for more colors with this new tool, 
new tool. Um, what what exactly do we need to enable in our kernel config to get access to like the line numbers and everything? I guess we need the debug info. So again, to get oh uh, for the line numbers. Yeah. Oh, that that uses uh, the file and line macros. Uh, debug info would get you like. Uh, function at the, the name of the function and then off, offset within the function, which isn't as nice as file and line number. File and line number does take up more space, but it's a debugging tool. Yeah, I was just wondering on uh, kernels users would most likely use if they're enabled uh, by default already, like the, the distro kernels. That, that's something that we could look at and then not how hard would it be to convince people to there, there's also like past precedents we're, we're just doing it the same way dynamic debug did using a file online number and also it turns out uh you have to store the module string fortunately these the, these things get deduped by the linker and the uh in the tag structure because modules that are built in otherwise won't have access to that the module name to be right which you kind of do. Yeah. So it's they, these, they feel a little bit bigger than they ought to be, but it turns out there there's good reasons for it, and I think it's, it's worth it. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to kind of point out uh, how, how much of this required, how much of this is stacked on top of the page extensions? I mean, without page extensions, does uh, all of it work or some of it or none of it? You're talking about some memory overhead or performance overhead? No, I mean, if page extensions is disabled, they configure boot time or whatever, um, how much of this is still working? Oh, um, yeah, memory allocation page, um, page allocators would not be able to track uh, memory because you, you need a pointer back to your allocated object so that you can decrement when it's freed. So you can, and there are, right now there are two separate right. config options what, for page allocations and slab allocations. What about, so you, say, latency tracking? Does that work? Yeah, for, yeah for, that's completely separate from all of this. It'll work fine for okay. page access. So I would yeah. recommend, you know, if you're trying to sell this, to try to split things out between, here's what you get with page extensions and yeah, yeah. don't, because page extensions is a major, I mean, I feel like you're being too casual about it. it, it it's, a, it's a big deal. I ran into it head on when I tried to add a counter to a struct page and everybody else runs into it when they try to add a flag or anything to struct page. So it's a dividing line. The distros aren't gonna turn it on. Um, I mean, that's my prediction. Uh, you may turn it on when you're debugging and that mm -hmm. makes sense, but that, uh, that's I, kind of the- I thought the whole point of PageX though was to make things that could be boot parameters. Yeah, but in practice, it turns out to be, oh, okay, if you want a high performance production kernel, you leave you, page You just don't off. want it on at all? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, that's what everyone does. Well, that's, that's a shame. You said earlier, which is really important, is you want this to be available for somebody you're talking to on IRC, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody has some random problem, and you want to say, hey, throw this command line on, you're running kernel with your problem that you're hitting right now, and giving this debug data. If you're using PageX, they didn't, they didn't do it at boot time, probably. And you've got to wait for them to go through a reboot cycle. And then you're back into the debugging world again. Yeah. So it doesn't buy you anything at that point. Thank you.